Morning. Hi. Hello. Good. How are you? How are you? Good. Your eyes are so blue. Oh my gosh. I love, I love your accent. I'm here for all the conversation today. I feel like I've got the worst Australian accent, so are you're probably getting like I, I the poor end of it. Maybe this is yeah. me being bad at not knowing. Are there different? Like, can you tell? If someone's in a different part of Australia based on their accent? Um, only if they're further up north, they tend to they tend to have more slogan to them oh or more brogan, I guess, to them um, than anywhere else. But yeah, down down in Melbourne, I feel like we're trying to oh, we're not trying, but I feel like we're a little bit more American than other parts of Australia, if that's a way to put it. Um, but it's how we have that. So like, I'm from Canada. Um, we have that, like, people out east, they have, like, a very, I don't even know what kind of accent, but, like, you can tell that they're, like, Easterners, um, but the rest of, the rest of Canada is normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so today we're kind of discussing more lifestyle clients, um, how we kind of differ our approach to our own training nutrition um, protocols as opposed to how much expectations we would put yeah. of our own onto our clients to achieve their goals yeah um, i want to do like things random up? rapid fire just to like break the ice and kind of like make it fun i just came out like with these tons of different questions um so i have 11 of them and then i will i'll ask you and then i will answer them as well so how long have you been coaching and then how long have you been competing I've been coaching since I was 16, so uh, 12 years. Um, uh, but that's not online. Like, yeah. I started obviously like in person, which I'm hugely grateful yeah. for. I think everyone should start in person. Um, and then I went to, uh, and competing, um, I've only done one show. So I only competed April last year. Um, but you still, but you still did it. I, it was so <laughs> funny. I was trying to like, find how because you didn't share that much about your competition so i was like trying to find and i ended up like finding on a no. website like your placing and everything um do you want to compete again i i do as redemption but like competing and it's never been it's never been like my sole purpose of doing what i do um competing was sort of just to give myself that experience on stage if i was going to be coaching competitors um a lot of people want me to compete again, so I think like I will, and then if I do well, then maybe I'll keep going. Um, but it's not really an aspiration of mine. It was just yeah. more to get that experience behind me. Um, but you know, I love, you know, it. No I love that. Um, okay, so I have been coaching for uh, like ten years, I think, and I've been doing online coaching for eight years, and I've been competing technically for two years in the NBC IFBB. So this is still fairly new to me. Um, okay, your favorite quote or mantra that keeps you going? Um, I, I don't always get it right, um, but ho hopefully I cannot butcher it too much. Um, it's clarity and vision, I flexibility in the amazing. process. Um, <laughs> or kind of too, which, no, which, what do you want to go? Um, for me I yeah. just feel like I've always like said this is remember who you are and level up so like always kind of like remember your roots and who you are but like keep keep growing and keep learning and keep like evolving um what is your preferred macro approach to clients or your favorite nutrition approach like whether it's carb cycling refeeds days consistent calories um, I'm very much what's going to work for the client. Um, and that goes across for lifestyle clients and uh, co uh, competition clients. Um, so usually just hitting a protein target, um, finding out where their calories need to be, and then it's usually based on personal preference where I situate the carbohydrates and fats. I do like to do some kind of caloric cycling mm -hmm. on a training day and a rest day. Um, the reason being just because if, you know, we want more energy availability on a training day than what we do on a rest day. So I tend to kind of I do that and just working a lot with competitors, the amount of food that they end up having to consume 
generally they like that little bit of a rest day where they can have a little bit more appetite regulation. Um, and it's a little bit less stress on the pancreas if you can alter carbohydrates to fat ratios a little bit there. Um, but yeah, generally it's about what's going to be adherent for them, um, what they're going to stick to. If there's someone that like, you know, works a job where they're on the road, I've got one client who's on the road all the time. It's sort of like, what's convenient? Like what can he kind of just bring with him? He doesn't have to keep cold or anything like that. He doesn't need a microwave for, um, and then, that's going to kind of more determine what foods we use and then what the macro breakdown will be for that. I don't particularly have one macro breakdown that I'm married to. The only incidents where I might change it would be if they were insulin resistant. Um, I would obviously favor fat, fats over carbohydrates. Um, I love, it. I love how like scenario. in depth you are with your responses. <laughs> it's so exciting. Um, for me, for the most part, <laughs> I would... I think for most of my clients, I would rather just have them on consistent days just because the type of my clients are, they're not, they're very much general population. Um, so yes, we do have goals and everything like that. Nobody's competing. So it is very much lifestyle. They are moms. They are full-time workers. They are like busy people. They have kids, things like that. So it's just like, it's less numbers for them to think about. Um, for, for, so for the most part, it's usually, um, I will teach them and educate. I have so many clients, I'm sure you do too. If, if they come to you and they're like, Ooh, what about carb cycling? Because it's like, it's, it's this thing, right? And they don't really know. And I'll, I'll explain it. And I'm like, yeah, but then there's all these numbers and you have to think about things. It's like, sometimes it's just easier to have like one set of numbers and you don't really have to think about anything else. Yeah. And like, even for some of my competitors, it's sort of like, okay, we're going to have the same, the same macros or even the same meals and you can obviously switch chicken for fish and, th and stuff like that or you know rice or potato but um the only difference is on our training days we're not yeah. having to work out carbohydrates okay. well. and yeah, yeah. Um, that's carb cycling okay. one exercise that you think all clients need to have in their program cramming that they hate <laughs> hacks no or hacks, hacks squats squats or body squats. Squats. do you have a lot of clients that don't like leg extensions uh, I feel like, yeah, I, th I think because they're such an isolated movement, they're quite painful. <laughs> nobody really enjoys them. Or nobody enjoys training yeah. them to the intensity yeah. that they should. Um, Bulgarian split squats, I get a lot of pushback for as well. I think I they're phenomenal. I think, we, I think you and I have, like, learned to embrace them. Most people are just like, I would rather avoid them. Or any yeah. kind of, like, split squats or lunges or anything like that. It's like that, that unilateral balance that most people don't like because they suck at it. And of course, if yeah. they suck at it, they're not going to keep doing it. So I always, I always program that in there. Yeah. Um, and some, sometimes it's like, because we usually put them towards the end of the session, people are just lazy and they want to get I home, but they're like, oh, I'm just prepared to do like, it. Yeah, like exactly. Something like that. Um, yeah. What? Dun, 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 dun. Where was I? Your favorite muscle group to train and your top two exercises for that muscle group. Um, um, I'm going to repeat myself. It'd be quads. And although my quads are shocking. Um, half squats. I love and, it. And I love that so much. Um, for me, lately, I am loving yeah. shoulders, specifically yes. rear delts. It has taken me like a friggin' decade to connect with my rear delts. And now that I've gotten them, I'm like, oh my God, I love it. So rear delt flies, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and then I guess rear delt rows. Do you, do you go through phases? It, like phases? Like, yeah, so like I kind of get hooked up on like, I want to grow my quads, I want to grow my quads. Like, like last year, I was like, I want to grow my glutes, I want to grow my glutes. And so then I love stuff like doing Bulgarian split squats and RDLs and uh, – and glute bridges but now i've like totally shifted i'm like i would prefer to for me like i'm still in prep and i'm competing this year and i'm still focused and like my overall goal is like i just need to grow and like everything needs to get bigger i spent the last like five or six weeks trying to figure out how to connect with my hamstrings because i feel like i could never get like a good activation with them and <laughs> now that i've done like all the fuckery in the gym i'm like okay now i have it so like my hamstring days are my favorite because I know how to actually feel it. But yeah, I'll kind of like go through once I master that, um, then it's like, okay, what's the next weakest thing that I need to work on, which is my, my quads. <laughs> um, okay. Let's, let's go into it. Um, 
Okay, so what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about lifestyle approaches or our approaches to lifestyle clients, at, even though we are competitors. Is that what we're, is that what we're going to dig into? Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Um, oh, so I was kind of just going to say, like, the general framework is obviously that with and I kind of try to take this approach for competition clients as well like for me it doesn't really change too much it's just about creating a little bit more of a leeway for social events for clients uh, for lifestyle clients um it depends on what stages you are in prep of like okay well are we going to allow for an off-plan meal or an untracked meal where I think with lifestyle clients I preemptively um insinuate that they going to be having these social events and they're going to have to eat off plan at some times or they're going to want to or they should because you know so the social aspect of our life is a very important health component of our health as well and we shouldn't dismiss that for the pursuit of you know chasing a certain goal or chasing a certain uh, sorry a certain goal weight or chasing a, cer a certain physique like we should always allow yeah absolutely i totally life. agree with that do you feel like a lot of clients, especially since you've competed, will kind of compare them to you and say like, oh, well, and, and it's, it's indirect and you never kind of instill anything, but let's just say they went out for the weekend and they didn't track and they're like, oh, but it's okay because like, I'm not competing, but kind of like throw that out there. Um, I guess. I get a lot actually I get it a lot with my competitors in that off season they're like oh I'm not in prep so it doesn't matter and I'm and then I'm sort of like the habits that you install That's now true. are going to transition over to your prep so let's be a little bit more adherent um but I think it goes back again to what I said at the start like clarity and vision flexibility in the process if you don't have what you wanted to eat available to you do your best that you can yep to make smart decisions, not overeat, make good choices. Um, you know, if you, and that's part of flexible dieting. Um, I, I told you, I went through a few studies yesterday on just the, um, there were studies behind how mm -hmm. successful people are in achieving their goals. Um, and it was like looking at flexible dieting. And one of the definitions was to compensate to an extent. So like if you eat a whole bunch of unhealthy food, then obviously you're going to choose healthier food options later on in the day. Um, and so I think it's like, it, yeah, it's just yeah. Like common sense to an extent. No, we, we I think like I went off track there. There. I don't think I answered um, your question. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, I always try to encourage, it's kind of like, you know how there's the term like the minimum effective dose? It's like you want to encourage kind of how I'm thinking. It's like you want to encourage clients to be as flexible as possible while still seeing results. Um, so not being like, yes, we, I, I always find like you, you want to find the spectrum and then where their balance is or where they find like the sustainability within that spectrum. So like when they start flexible dieting, it's like, okay, let's get kind of like meticulous for a little bit at the beginning. Let's, let's track everything. Let's not have too many social events at once. Like let's kind of figure out where we are let's build some habits because right now they're kind of at the other end we want to get to that extreme in like a very respective way and then kind of like find their balance in the middle um so if it means having some untracked meals or whatever but at least giving them the tools to build like their discipline because like once you become disciplined then you have that freedom and you can kind of know like when to push and when to pull and when to have like diet breaks or when to kind of go off track however the client feels so that they're, they're not kind of being like, Oh, I'm, I'm super rigid. But then the moment they do go out and they have an untracked meal, they're like, I, I fell off, you know? So it's like you, you went to that extreme. Mm. Okay. Now let, now let's bring it back. So kind of finding like the balance in that big spectrum of gray area. Yeah. And I think that it's going to be very clear that if we're trying to create change, there has to be some level of Absolutely. sacrifice. Absolutely. And of course, like everyone's sacrifice is going to be a little bit different. We know the extreme ends of sacrifice because of competing. And that's something that I really like um, being a competitor. And I, again, like, as you know, I don't do competition clients. Everyone is lifestyle, but I do really like the skills and the awareness 
and the protocols and the discipline that I've learned from competing because I can apply that to clients like respectfully, but I know that there is like, there are boundaries. And like, just because I push a certain way or I'm kind of like extreme when it comes to competing and prep, most lifestyle clients don't need to have that. They don't need to have that mentality, but there are, I feel like some kind of overlaps and at least I can, I can guide clients mm. to be like, no, that is extreme. That is obsessive. That's not going to be sustainable. We don't need to start implementing all this cardio or, or whatever protocols are getting like super specific with macros. Like, yes, we want to be specific, but like being extreme, we don't, we don't need to have that because that's not sustainable and that's not lifestyle balance. Yeah. There was a few points that I wanted to bring up there. The first one being that, um, let's say that you're um and this was in one of the studies that i referenced so they found more success in people who set smaller goals than what they did bigger goals um so bigger goals i think mm -hmm. the success rate was about 10 percent um whereas in smaller goals it was a it was closer to 30 percent. so we're talking about like 10 to 20 pounds as opposed to like 30 to 40 pounds of weight loss um, and what they found was that yeah obviously you're more successful if you set the smaller goals um and what that might mean for you that it doesn't mean that if you want to lose 40 pounds that you're absolutely doomed it just means that you might be more successful in breaking that up so aim for 10 pounds and then or five pounds and then what does the next five pounds look like and your level of discipline or sacrifice will probably have to change each time you hit a five pound landmark because your body's what it's going to take to lose that first five pounds is probably not much that more, not much of a lifestyle change than to lose that second five pounds you're probably going to have to be a little bit more stricter and pull it back a little bit more create a little bit more i don't want to say discipline but a little bit yeah. more of structure and healthy habits um and then and so on for the continual five pounds because the body's yeah, going like, to slow it's like a, to that a funnel right the, the, the closer you get to the goal or like the, yeah. the small the last five pounds or whatever it is you have to be more specific um and so I have one of the questions yes. from the Q&A box that I had, which kind of like attaches to this. She said, what would be your long-term approach for a female client with high body fat percentage who wants to lose fat, but also gain muscle? Um, do you want to answer it? Um, yeah, so yeah. I would exactly what we kind of just said there. Like I would start off more, more aggressive at the start, aim for maybe like one to 1 1.5% of body weight loss per week. And then as we, as like we get into the deficit that knowing that that rate of weight loss is going to stall. Um, so then just slowing it down, but yeah, as we said, breaking it down into smaller goals, um, kind of being, you know, this is when we want to achieve the first five pounds of weight loss. And this is when we want to achieve the second five pounds of weight loss. Um, how I would approach it. Like it's, yeah. it's very hard to answer, <laughs> um, just based on the client, but that kind of gives you an overview of like the uh, right. yeah I'm, I'm similar I would like to go in like phases as well um so breaking into smaller chunks going into phases same thing um obviously like we need to assess where the client is right now if she's been trying to diet for months or years we need to figure out if she's like trying to be in a deficit or if she's in maintenance right now I would say like if the client has probably a lot of body fat then the main focus would be focusing on the fat loss and not necessarily the muscle gain, but at least maintaining as much muscle as possible, kind of like stripping down, re like relatively maybe doing diet breaks here and there, seeing kind of where we are, what we're working with. And then kind of once we get kind of like a chunk of the weight off or a good portion of it, then it's like, let's focus on body recomposition and less about like just hard fat loss. Um, because obviously if, if we do it right, we can kind of get the best of both. <laughs> Yeah, and if they've got a lot of fat to lose, they're not going to be in a state where they're risking yeah, the muscle um, muscle loss. But uh, I, I find that a lot of people who I I, I want to say I don't want to say fail dieters, but I don't really I can't really think of a better term at the moment. But people who have been trying to lose weight for uh, or been unsuccessful in their weight loss journey to date, I find that they usually come to me with very low caloric intakes. And then yeah. I'm like, I've got nowhere to go from here. Like, you've left me with nothing. Either you're tracking incorrectly 
or you've just had this high extent of metabolic adaptation that your body just isn't going to respond to any kind of deficit at the moment, um, whether that be hormonally or, or whatnot. So um, usually then like my only option is to have you in this holding phase for another six weeks where we aim to bring up energy availability so then we can have more of a, success, a successful fat loss phase. And then that fat loss phase might have to be more, um, I guess, in intervals as far as like we do six weeks of weight of fat loss, then we go to another holding phase and we do another six weeks of fat loss. Otherwise, we're just going to find that yeah. it keeps stalling. As Absolutely. I totally weeks. agree with all of that. <laughs> um, so with that, I had another question where it says, how aggressive would you take a lifestyle client's fat loss phase? If they didn't, like, if they didn't have that high amount of body fat to lose and we're just kind of looking at an average rate across the weight loss period, it would probably be more between 0.5 and 1% of their body weight per week. Um, if, it was a, if it was a competition client and we're in an off-season and we're just looking at doing a little bit of a tidy up, I'm usually really aggressive just because I want to get them in and out of that mini cut as soon as possible and continue growing. So then usually I aim for about 1% to 1.5% of fat loss. Would you presume, and this is how I would take it anyway, is you could probably, um, I'd say like a competitor can probably have that mindset where it's okay that they can push a little bit harder, where they're probably less likely to um, maybe binge or fall off track or whatever the case is because they, like, they know how to diet and they know kind of that approach. Um, I think it's more so that if they're in their off season, they are wanting to grow and they're wanting to get back to that growing stage that they would prefer just to go get, quick get and, that, you know, get all in kind of thing, uh, get in and out. As, yeah. Um, whereas, yeah, they're not, not, they're not looking to sustain that weight loss for a long period of time, that they don't have to have healthy and sustainable methods to yeah, achieve absolutely. that amount um, of drop. For me, my response is it, it all depends like on the why behind the client like why do they want to maybe be aggressive in their fat loss phase and usually I will have this conversation I always I will have this conversation with the client before and say like there's a bajillion different ways that we can take this fat loss phase we can um we can go a little bit more aggressive and there's always kind of like red flags or health concerns that will come up along the way um and it's just a matter of when they come up and who notices they come up so if the client's saying like, oh, I want to keep dieting, I want to keep losing weight, but their sleep is going down and their their mindset is going down and maybe they're reaching for food and like all these like other things are coming into play. It's like, okay, well, we can't push this hard. Um, so I think it's how aggressive I would take a client, a lifestyle client's fat loss phase. I think a lot of it depends on their, on their mindset, on their adherence, past mm -hmm. adherence and current adherence um, and what their lifestyle entails as well if they're super yeah i think that was a question that i wanted to ask you um sort of if you have a client that's got a, a huge amount of uh weight that she wants to or he or she wants to lose um what kind of lifestyle habits do you make sure are in place and sort of like your prerequisites to weight loss i guess like what are the um uh I get, yeah, I guess that's the only way I can kind of term it is, yeah, what's the prerequisites of fat loss? Like, is it you have to be getting eight hours of sleep each night? You have to be drinking a certain amount of water, fruit and veg at every meal. Like, I feel like these are little lifestyle habits that we can kind of imp implement before we focus on. Yeah, I, I like this question. Thank so. you. I feel like there's, and I say this like respectfully <laughs> because it can come off like very harsh, um, is that I feel like we need to earn the right to go into a diet or to to kind of go through a fat loss phase or a deficit, mm -hmm. whatever we want to call it. And there are definitely some prerequisites that are required um, or at least very much encouraged if as long as everything is happening like fairly naturally, like if, if their stress levels are down, which is great, if they're sleeping great, but if they're taking like tons of supplements to try to sleep every night, probably not there. Um, if they have a good relationship with food, they have flexibility, they have a social life where just things in their life are good and they're kind of like coasting and there's no like big triggers or um, I don't even know what term to use, like red flags. Um, as long as they have been, as I, I feel like they need to like prove themselves. 
you know, where it's like, okay, well, if, if we're going to be dieting harder and cutting calories, let's just say we're focusing on like the um, caloric restriction rather than energy expenditure, then do you have a good relationship with food? Are you currently like consuming enough protein? Do you have the flexibility, um, good bowel movements, things like that? I feel like there's a a lot of them, there's kind of like a, a grocery list of things and it's like, which ones apply to certain clients? Yeah. Um, it kind of, I don't know why, but I'm imagining really um, Mulan. <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll make a man out of you kind of thing. Like, you've got to hit these standards before you can, uh, I, I don't it. know, go to war. Um, <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, do we, did you want to fire off any more questions or do you want me to go to start going through these go things that go. I put together? I didn't put them together. Uh, that's, that's me over exaggerating. Go, I go through this because I'm really excited for this. Okay. Um, so uh, the first study was called Goal Setting and Achievement in Activity Tracking App. So it was a study of MyFitnessPal. And this was done in 2020. Um, so it assessed the difference between setting a goal and achieving a goal. Um, and these are just some notes from the study that are just copy and pasted into words so it's a little bit easier to read for the life. Um, we find that overall 18.2% of weight loss goals are met. Um, so that might seem like a good number, but when you reverse that, it's like 81.8% of goals are, are, are failed. So 81.8% of people don't achieve their goals. Um, people with the easiest goals, uh, which was between 1% to 2% of their initial weight, um, are most likely to achieve their goals with nearly 30% success. Um, and, uh, and of these users are reaching at least a hundred percent of their initial weight loss, uh, achieve their initial weight loss goal, um, of users with the most difficult goals. So we're talking about 40 to 60% of their body weight, only 10% were likely to achieve it. Um, what was else? Uh, Uh, contrary to what findings from medical studies on weight loss maintenance might suggest, there is no amount of early weight loss that is too much. Rather, more early progress towards a goals uh, towards a goal predicts a higher pers- uh, propensity to achieve that goal. Um, so, essentially, what they found is those who achieved weight loss or did more tracking data and things like that within the first seven days were more likely to achieve their goals. So it says here for a goal of 40 to 80 pounds, users who log a weight all seven days of their first week are more than twice as likely to ultimately achieve their goal than those who log once, uh, only once, moving from 10 to 20% likelihood. Similarly for a goal from 10 to 20, 20 pounds, um, we see a change in between logging one weight and seven weights from 15 up to 75 uh, 35%. So essentially, like, I feel like a lot of coaches are like, we're going to build these habits along the way, or we're going to be- implement these things as we go. Whereas I'm sort of like, let's try to get everything right in the first seven weeks, because that's going to, well, like sort of after reading this, that might be my approach from now on is like, let's try to get as much right as we can in the first seven days. So that we can have the most uh, likelihood of yeah, I, I feel like long-term. so much of it. I'm as you're as you're reading all of that. I'm like, oh, that's that client. Oh, but then that's that that's client. Whereas like sometimes doing everything at yeah. once is insanely overwhelming. Um, sometimes other clients, it's like okay, mm-hmm. they, if they already have like a decent understanding or some kind of background experience with tracking their nutrition and resistance training then it's kind of easy to be like okay these are all the things that we're going to start building upon which is great if a client comes to us or it comes to me and they're like i don't work out i have no idea about nutrition but i want to start doing all the things it's like okay well this is just way too much information because your lifestyle doesn't doesn't allow for this you know so it's like sometimes there are clients where it's like we need to focus on one little thing for four weeks and then we're going to focus on one other thing for the next four weeks because it's it's that on again off again oh I I I missed a day I screwed up I started over like 
kind of breaking that down. So maybe that maybe that comes more from the coach then like as far as like we still want the client to feel like they're able to achieve everything 100 percent in that first seven days so yes. maybe we just don't give them as much so like yeah maybe we say okay we're gonna start we're going to have a three-day plan here uh this is your macro target this is your caloric target this is how you track here's some education on tracking yeah kill it for the first seven days um i feel like like if we can set them up for success in that first seven days then that's probably the best approach to take rather than like you said trying to give them a six day a week training plan trying to give them copious amount of cardio um really restrictive diets and things like that and expecting them to be able to do that in the first seven days is very yes, unbelievable. I, I totally agree um what was i gonna say yeah we we need to set them up um for me sometimes it means checking in with clients twice a day depending on where they are, where it's like, okay, what are you going to do today? What is your goal today? Yes, you're clear on that. At the end of the day, did you achieve that goal? Um, and just really, I think a lot of, um, sorry, all of the success isn't necessarily about what habits are effective. It's their mindset around overcoming it. Because if they have a history of like, oh, I screwed up, I failed, I fell off track, I can't commit, um, I'm that kind of person that cannot match their goals. I'm never going to lose weight. Like that, that mindset that comes from years and years of social media and lies and things that we tell ourselves. Right. So it's, it's kind of like a, how it's not the chicken before the um, egg. It's like how a lot of people want to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time. Like, yes, it can happen, but usually we need to focus on like one thing first. Um, I feel like same thing with like building new habits, mm. but then breaking old ones as well that don't necessarily align. It's like, yeah, we can do both, but maybe we just focus on breaking those old ones first and then we have that clean slate and then starting to build from there. But again, like everyone's different. I feel like um, just kind of from our conversation, I feel like the clients that I have are not more beginners. Um, and I say that like very respectfully, but more general population rather than the athletes or competitors or having that mm. kind of mindset. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so the second study was, or well, this would have been actually the first study because this one was done earlier in 2019. Um, just, it was called towards a sustainable nutrition program in physique sport um, and a narrative review. Um, I know Eric Helms was one of the authors here. I can't remember the other authors. Um, so it says flexible dieting is defined by behaviors such as eating a wide variety of foods while still playing, paying attention to one's weight. Um, talk, so taking smaller serving sizes than desired and compensating at later meals. So consuming healthier foods, if unhealthier foods were consumed earlier. Um, a solid body of research indicates that a rigid approach to dieting is associated with the diverse outcomes in both males and females. For example, fasting for long periods of time, um, which is a rigid control behavior, has been shown to prospectively predict binge eating and related behaviors in adolescent girls. And in women with bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder, more over cross-sectional research examining the impact of the specific, specific rigid control behavior, namely meal skipping, has been linked to behavioral to behavior to, has been linked has linked this behavior and an increase uh, in frequency of binge eating in women with binge eating disorder and with the depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and quality of impairment in women with anorexia nervosa and binge and bulimia nervosa. Yeah which is really quite alarming. Like if we kind of look at like just the restrictive behaviors that we put on competitors and that some coaches put on their lifestyle clients and the impact that this can have on someone's mental health, like this is, this is serious stuff. Like this is stuff that's Absolutely. going to affect them. Um, I have time. a lot of clients that have kids and a big factor that we talk about constantly is like, what are the actions that your kids are seeing? Um, we want to make sure, and it's not that like, mm. whatever the mom eats, all the kids have to eat, the whole family has to eat it as well. That's not it at all. But like, what, what example, because like kids see everything, they pick up on everything. Right. Um, so it's like, what, what example are we setting for the kids? And I believe that absolutely as well. Um, 
I think that's really important. I think that's a reason why I like flexible dieting so much. That's a big reason why I got into it because it helps to break down the, um, and it doesn't necessarily like overcome eating disorders. Like I'm not saying that by any means, but it can allow for a little bit more flexibility and having that, like being okay with like, okay, well maybe I didn't eat all my vegetables every day and I had cookies afterwards. Like that's okay. Because like, as long as you're hitting your goal at the end of the day, like we're, we're still having a balance and learning to find that balance. Um, because again, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they're like, I'm, I'm trying to eat balanced, but I find that like, I'm, I'm reaching for the cookies at the end of the day and I feel guilty for having those afterwards. And I, I just can't find the balance. And it's because of the, like the extreme and the rigidity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, if I touch back on that first study where I said only 18.2% of people achieve their goal, I was listening to a podcast. I think it was on stronger by science. And there was another study done where although the achievement rate based on the data or the tracking data was low, people's perception of achieving their goals was much higher. So I think that was around about 40 or 50%. So I think that's something yeah. that's important to play in here is like, if you had that cookie or whatnot, that doesn't mean that you necessarily failed your goal. Like what's your perception of success here? Is your perception of sex success being able to follow a healthy lifestyle and still enjoy these little treats here and there and be able to have meals with your family. Yeah. Cause to me, that's a pretty successful goal, um, or a pretty successful outcome that yes, we nailed it then. Um, and I think like, as far as what you said about like children watching, if I have a mother who's so focused on losing weight that she won't have Christmas dinner with her family, like that's detrimental to not only her and her, her well being. But also the kids that are sitting at that dinner table watching mum eat chicken and rice and not what the family's yeah. eating. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I'm constantly like working on with clients and being like, okay, how can, how can we kind of meet in the middle with all of this while still like achieving their goals and things like that? I have a client right now and she is on, we're kind of pushing a, li a little bit more aggressive in a fat loss phase. Um, but she is currently dating and she's going out on dates like once a week. And she's like, I feel like I can't, she's like, I'm like, I'm guesstimating at her. my meals, <laughs> but I'm worrying that these guesstimated meals, because like, she's not getting obsessive and like planning everything ahead of time. And she's like, we're going to go to this restaurant and I'm going to have these macros. Like she's going to go out and enjoy. Right. But she's still trying her best to like stay on track. And she's like, I feel that if I go out once a week, I'm not going to be as successful with my fat loss. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's see, let's see what happens. Let's see how big of an impact that one meal is. And I assure her that like, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but it, it's about finding that balance so that she can still achieve fat loss and still achieve success while still having a social life or a dating life or whatever. And, and it's like that, um, kind of how I said, like the minimum of effective dose, big let's, let's see how much of an impact that actually makes. Um, and if you're still like reaching fat loss and we're still seeing progress on a weekly or a monthly basis, then we're totally in the right direction. And we don't have to get as extreme because you're able to enjoy the process at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that like a, a lot of people get anxious when it comes to eating out and you learn that, most places are pretty flexible in making like if you just request something they're pretty flexible um but i usually advise clients like to have a look if you're if you're choosing the restaurant just have a look find somewhere that you're comfortable with know that you can make a yeah. smart decision when you yeah. go um, that's go it um oh sorry so do you want do, do you want have more or did you want to touch on something else okay good <laughs> i love it <laughs> Um, so this is from the same study. It said the female bodybuilders in the Ibit Fit Your Macros group had a better micronutrient profile compared to strict dieters in the sole study comparing macronutrient based to traditional uh, strict dieting practices, um, which I found super interesting. So rather than having a meal plan, those who ate uh, to a macro based plan where they had a lot more food variety had a much more mi uh, better micronutrient profile than those who had a strict meal plan. Um, uh, so then it says thus, uh, for example, rather than prescribing specific foods in specific amounts at specific times, a macronutrient or energy 
content-based plan that allows for a wide variety of food choices with flexible meal times and target ranges. So for an example, within a plus or minus 10 grams or 100 calories uh, range um, can be implemented after the prescription of a basic nutritional education. Um, increases in flexible control during the course of a weight management intervention in women who were overweight and obese. Um, was the only variable to consistently predict long-term sustained weight loss, which I find super interesting. So, like, it's the only variable that was proven to uh, show consistent weight so loss. Was I've heard diet. things about that um, before, and I've seen this with myself, and I've seen this with clients as well. I will kind of let within, like, reason kind of, like, you know how some people just kind of, like, need to learn from their own experience? I will do that, but in a very like guiding way. So if a client's just like, I really want to eat ice cream, I'll be like, freaking eat it every day. They will get to the point where they're like, I really don't care for that ice cream anymore. And it's like, they almost get sick of it. And then they're like, I know I feel so much better. And it's, they're, they're building that autonomy and they're building their self-confidence and they're building the, yeah, their own confidence and skills to be able to be like, I could have that ice cream, but I know I'm going to feel better if I eat the stir fry or whatever it is. Um, and then that teaches them so much confidence. And I think that has this huge spillover effect into so many areas of their life as well. It's like, I can make that choice and I don't want it because I know that I feel better. I've, I've seen that with clients all the time. Yeah. And I think like, like as far as if, if they're the ones making that decision, it's going to have a lot, a lot higher of a success rate than if you're telling them not to eat that ice cream. If they get to a point where they say, I don't want ice cream anymore, like that, that's going to be a much more, a, a much better long-term solution to yeah. not eating ice cream again than yeah. uh, not eating ice cream every day than you telling I've them had, they're not allowed to eat I've ice cream I've had some every clients day. where I, um, I constantly see their food logs and I'm like, yeah, you could be eating that and you're hitting your let's just say your protein intake was protein powder because it tastes delicious. But if you're eating like 80 grams of it a day and they're like, yeah, but I don't want to like give it up. I like it or whatever the case is. It's like, okay, well, can we meet in the middle? And sometimes with clients, I'll be like, can we just entertain this idea for like two weeks or even one week? Be like, let's just try it. If you don't like it, we'll go back. And then usually I'll, I'll kind of like lead them big. Do you feel confident that you can achieve this? And they're like, yeah, I can do anything for a week, like no problem. And then they realize, okay, maybe it is better to have different choices. And this could be the same thing with the, the ice cream and the vegetables or whatever the case is. Just kind of like, I, I like to almost think of it like the coaches or we're kind of like the mirror for the client and we get them to make their own choices, but we kind of like lead them into making their own choices yeah yeah um and just a little bit of background um i don't know if you know but i have a history of eating disorders um and that was one of the big turning points for me like growing up i was kind of forced into this healthcare system um and it was ne never successful and it wasn't until i sort of had enough of living the life that, that i was living that i decided to turn my life around and i feel like that's that's the same for a lot of people if someone's if someone's overweight um, or, you know, have, has, is at risk of heart disease, like cardiovascular disease, obese, uh, sorry, uh, type 2 diabetes, all these things, we, by telling them that we can't force them to lose weight, they've got to get to a point where they say, oh, I want to lose weight. Like, I, I want to do this for me kind of thing, no matter how much we try. And, and, and it's the same in the opposite direction. Like, someone who's got... Um, an eating disorder severely underweight um we can't force they have them to be to want to gain weight and they yeah they have to see the value in that um there was one more study on hunger and pal pal palatability and this was done in 1984 so this study investigated the effects of pal palatability on ratings of hunger and other states food preferences uh, bodies, uh, bodily sensations, feelings, and moods. Um, assessments of these were made before, during, and after 12 healthy female subjects ate small, equally caloric meals um, of either highly preferred or less preferred foods. Two hours after the meal, ratings of desires to eat and, um, and hungers 
and hunger were significantly higher after consumption of the higher highly preferred food um and this effect did not occur with the less preferred food okay so that's like what you <laughs> so um I guess I, I, I like it. Um, I guess it kind of just suggests that, like, I, I think when it comes down to um, if we're looking at kind of satisfying cravings and things like that or satisfying hunger, it's not just about eating what you kind of crave or what you feel like because there is a nutritional and a caloric component to that that's going to come into play um, as well as total food volume. So I think that that's worth understanding that our body will always crave what it needs. It's designed to do that. Um, so having more of these nutritionally dense foods may be favorable as far as even kind of skewing hunger, yeah. fueling or skewing cravings um, rather than giving yeah. into it because then we tend to want more. I try to that. get my clients yeah. to learn their own cues or understand the difference between having a hung having an appetite and being hungry. Yeah, so um isn't it uh, a physiological yeah. hunger so, versus so having hunger? an appetite would be like boredom hunger yeah. or or emotional hunger. Yeah. Like having yeah. like a emotional um cue or mm. actually being hungry is like my stomach or I feel like I have low blood sugar or something like that where it's like an actual physical symptom um, and being able to get clients to understand the difference between the two and then them saying for themselves what they actually think it is and sometimes it's like okay if you're craving something but it's like really calorically dense have it but then maybe I don't know I'm just gonna say like a piece of chocolate they really like chocolate and I just, they just want to eat it like that's cool eat the freaking chocolate but then you know what maybe have a salad with it or have something else. I mean, you don't have to like put the chocolate on the salad, but like you kind of have it like there as well and then kind of like um, fill that. I have one client and she she loves volume food. She will like eat volume food like until she implodes, I swear. And she's just like, that, that's just how I am and she likes it. But then she also likes the really dense foods. So this is where the flexible dieting comes in. It's like, okay, well have the dense foods sometimes, but then if you like the, the volume foods maybe kind of like mix that up throughout the day and when she can develop her own menu and skills and the tools that she's learned into that then she has the confidence to to be successful yeah yeah i really like that and i think that um uh i lost my train of thought there um i was just the um, yeah, density forgot. of foods and then the emotional appetite or hunger. Oh, mine was going to be, um, so generally um, when it comes to kind of craving food, and, and I guess this goes for more competition clients and lifestyle clients. With lifestyle clients, I might, I might encourage more of a portion control amount of that food, um, as you kind of just suggested there. But um, usually I say ride the wave, um, knowing that these cravings will, will pass. Um, there's a, there's a practice that I like to use as called delay, distract, decide, which is sort of just delaying that craving or, um, that thought for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, finding something to distract yourself in the meantime, and then decide whether or not you want to, you want to go ahead with that decision. Um, most of the time you'll forget about it after distracting yourself. But um, yeah, most of the time, I think that we all know that cravings sort of go through this uh, uh, inverted bell curve where they kind of go really high and then we know that they're going to lessen. And I think as long as you can get through that first initial wave, you'll be fine. Um, and that's usually my approach is like to encourage. Uh, yeah, I, I like that. There's I also like, the maybe the client's actually dehydrated, right? That's a common thing where it's like all of a sudden they mm. or they're bored um, and just picking up on like different things. But like, okay, well maybe you actually haven't drank enough water and you're consistently under under hydrated um, or dehydrated, and you're thinking, oh, it's be like I'm craving chocolate all the time or I'm craving chips or whatever um, mineral it is that they're deficient in, and it's like okay. Well, well, let's kind of address what else is going on and what other like big rocks are going on in here um, to kind of see like what, what is going on. I think there's, yeah, the, the almost like distracting 
I think is always a good thing. I've, I've encouraged that with clients as well. And that's been like really successful or there's the, what is it called? Like the, the broccoli test. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's like, if you're actually hungry or say a client's like, Oh my God, I was so hungry. And I was like craving pizza or I get, um, something like, I was just listening to my hunger cues and I needed pizza. It's like, I don't think your hunger cues would tell you that, but like, let's again, like, let's ride that wave. Like, that's cool. Um, but then I will kind of like play out the situation. Like, okay, if you're actually hungry, grab a serving of protein and grab some vegetables or have a bowl of broccoli. If you're actually hungry, you'll eat that bowl of broccoli. And that's just like an analogy, right? It can be freaking whatever vegetable or whatever it is. Um, but usually somebody with clients I'll actually encourage is like, if you're going to like over consume something, but you still want it to be like a, a good choice, grab another serving of protein and grab something with fiber in it. And then like chug a big ass glass of water and that will probably satisfy you a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that idea. Um, okay. Speaking of hunger and things, I have another question that I want to ask. Um, someone asked, how do you deal with hunger and what are some strategies and tips? I guess we could do this from a, you can share your approach, whether it was lifestyle or competing, and then I'll share mine. Um, so definitely my, my first approach is the, um, delayed distracted side. Um, and I, I have a worksheet that I usually send out to clients that they can use if they, if they need it. Um, the second approach is drink water, like you said, um, or, you know, a tea or a sugar-free beverage, something like that. Um, I also like the idea of having maybe like sugar-free yeah. jelly on hand in the fridge, um, that you can, you can use to kind of fill up on. Um, then I guess like the next option is to have a portion controlled sides of it. Um, and then, but I think that that's kind of a risky element. Um, if you, if you say a portion <laughs> controlled, you don't know how big that's going to be. Um, but yeah, they're, they're usually my first few tips, but I think like the most successful yeah. one is the like delayed distraction um, side. It's everything that I would have said is just repeating. Um, Volume foods can help with satiety, drink plenty of water, keep protein intake high, lots of fiber intake. Um, me personally, I don't like a lot of um, either low calorie or artificial foods. I just find, and maybe this is me coming from like a competitor's perspective is like, I find that the calories or the low calories aren't worth it. I usually have a lot of digestion issues that come with the, the fake filler foods or like the low calorie stuff, or I just find that it tastes gross. So for me, from a competitor perspective, if I'm hungry, I'm just like, deal with it. It means that the protocols we have in place are working. Now that is not necessarily something that I would instill into lifestyle clients, but I, I feel like a lot of lifestyle clients, especially when they're kind of going through a diet phase for the first time with me, they're like, yeah, but I'm hungry. Like, that, that means it's working and you are going to be hungry and you kind of have to like, to some point you have to understand that that's going to happen. Um, but obviously like ma managing yeah. that, right? I think, I think Austin Stout was the first one to yeah. sort of like term it as embrace the hunger, um, which I love, like, because it is, it's a sign that everything that we're doing is working. Your body's in a deficit, yeah. it's burning body fat, it's going to want to eat. Um, you're going to feel hungry. And I think that the, the more skilled you get at dieting, for lack of a better yeah, term. That, the, that the was one thing I really embraced this year um, when I was competing. Like, I would get excited. I would kind of, like, flip my mindset. This is, like, this, this sick and twisted thing that we do as competitors is, like, we get excited when it gets harder. Because, I like, guess yes, that it's working. And it's, like, the, yeah. the harder something feels, the, it means the more progress that you're making. Yeah. And, and I think the sensitivity to, like, sugar-free or sugar alcohols is very individual. Um, obviously, yeah, if it's causing more digestive distress than what it is causing yeah. benefit, then don't do it. Um, there was something else that you said, um, oh, with the high volume foods, I, I do like that approach too. I'm a little bit more strategic in that when it comes to a deep deficit as far, and also by driving up protein intake and allowing more calories to be situated towards yeah, protein totally. than carbohydrates or fats. Um, however, I do notice that um, and this goes back to kind of, um, I guess, 
uh, shutting off that that hunger signaling it's not just about food volume it's yep. also about caloric density too so no matter how much we drive up the food volume there still needs to be that understanding yes that you yeah that's something that I, I tried to like explain with clients yeah. being like at the end of the day the meal is 300 calories where it's whether it's a big ass salad or it's like a, a kit kat bar or whatever it's still going to and i kind of simplify to clients in that like it's yes it's not going to like fill up your stomach and you're not going to have that like fullness feeling as much but it's still going to be the same i guess almost effect in terms of like how your body is is taking in those 300 calories right like we can really simplify it and be like a calorie is a calorie mm. but then of course we can go on the other expect the other end and be like no a calorie isn't a calorie and obviously like the nutrient profile matters as well Mm. It's so many yeah, it, it's I always that. i feel like in in our world every answer is it depends <laughs> it's always like yeah. different. Yeah, especially being in the social media space where we're kind of limited to like these one minute videos because people's attention spans is so low and it's like i can't i like yeah i think <laughs> I, I could go on another brand about this, but even like the reels that I put out and then people think because I say one thing, I, I, I they, they, they take it hard. as an absolute. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. no, that's not what I said. Yo, you're doing that. Like, 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 like so much, there's so much psychotic thinking and yeah, you can say one thing and unless you have like eight backup videos, but the thing is nobody has the attention span to listen to everything so you can't get the full explanation and it's like how can i yeah. explain something simply and offend the least amount of people <laughs> yeah do you follow um yeah. uh, coach carter live run bank yeah and he will put out like this this reel and then he'll write a very good caption underneath it no. but nobody ever reads the captions they go straight to the comment section and bastard or, or whatever he said and he's like yeah i i find <laughs> anytime someone on their reels post read the caption nobody's gonna read the caption like you you gotta you gotta say the words yeah. in the actual reel nobody's gonna read the attack fan these days and yeah that's just that's just the nature of social media yes yeah Okay. Did you have other questions or anything that you wanted to go through? Are we on a time limit or? Um, there was, there was one thing that I wanted to touch on, which was, um, just about like kind of creating strategies yeah. around achieving your goals. So I think there's this term called, um, I wrote it down because I did a few studies on it, but it's called implementation intentions. So what, uh, yes. where, what, when, and so, I think that like having a goal is good, but having a strategic plan of how to set it out is even better. So there was a study done on uh, registered voters in 2008 um, and they gave them three scripts. I'll go over it briefly, but the, the third script had the follow-up questions of uh, what time will you vote? Where will you be coming from? And what will you be doing beforehand? And this increased the turnout by 4% points and 9% points in households occupied by a single owner which is, is, is quite a decent amount. Um, and then there was a, another study um, done in 2002 with 248 participants, um, and they were split into three groups. The first group was asked to record when they exercise. Um, the second group was asked to do the same but received a motivational message and pamphlets on heart health and why exercise was important. And uh, the same, uh, the third group did the same as the second group. It did, they wrote down when, where, and how they were going to exercise. Um, so in the first group, they just reported when they exercise. Only mm -hmm. well, there was a 38% success rate. Second group that received the pamphlets, um, same kind of response, a 35% success rate. And in the this was over a two-week period. Um, and in the third group that did the when, where, and how they had a 91% yeah, I, success rate. So I find that's, getting that's so clear um, on the goals. Go, sorry, keep going. Oh, so yeah, and then I was just going to say, um, 
but creating coping plans around that. And this goes back to like my initial statement is clarity and vision flexibility in your process. We know that hurdles are always going to come our way. There's never going to be a perfect environment for us to be able to achieve our goals. Um, that's just not the way that the world, world works, unfortunately. So um, I think having coping plans as far as like if the situation X happens, how will I overcome that? So let's just say that you finish work at 5 p.m., you plan on getting to the gym at 5.30, but your boss asked you to do overtime and stay back past six. And you then, you knew that you might be asked to do overtime that week. So you had the plan, okay, if I got asked, if I get asked to do overtime this week, if I finish at six, I'm going to go to gym at 6.30. If I work beyond 6.30, then I'm going to go to the gym the next day. And so I think just having like little plans in place like that, um, knowing that, um, I don't know, like I, I, I'm going out this day, if the, if I don't get back in time to be able to get my lunch, these are my options. For yeah, when I, I love that so much time. with my clients. Um, we recently did like goal setting. We kind of do that at the beginning of the year, resolutions, whatever we want to call it. And it, I made like the list of, okay, what is your goal? What are the challenges that come around this goal? What are the sacrifices that are required around this goal? What are little actions that you can start taking today that work towards the goal? So it's the same thing, like building up on um, – getting really clear instead of just having like this goal and be like, I just want to achieve this this year. It's like, okay, well we need some context. We need like some, some meat in this substance. Right. Um, and then what, one thing I'll be specific with an example is I have some clients, let's say they're like, I, I really want to get to the gym three times this week. That is like their goal. They know that maybe sometimes they do have to do shift work. They have to stay later. I will get them one thing that my clients and I focus a lot on is organization and time blocking in their schedule. Big, like, okay. If you want to get to the gym three times this week, for the most part, we normally would time block out or say, okay, we're going to go to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But instead, if we know that sometimes that doesn't work, let's actually time block out four days so that if this one day doesn't happen, we have another opportunity to do that and we're already set up for success. So again, the, the same thing, it's like planning, planning that something bad is going to happen or that life isn't going to happen exactly to plan. We know it's not always going to be, so it's always kind of having, mm. not thinking worst case scenario, but like, okay, yeah, if this doesn't happen, then what, what else, what are other options instead of, I screwed up on my goals, the whole week is a wash, I'm gonna start over on Monday again. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, so I think, like, to, to kind of recap our, our discussion today. Yes. Flexible dieting is Absolutely. king. <laughs> Possibly a faster rate of weight loss at the beginning of a fat loss phase, um, knowing that that will inevitably slow down towards a later end. Goals will shift um, throughout Absolutely. the stages of achieving your goals, or the, the amount of sacrifices Absolutely. that you have to make will change. Um, setting like smaller that. goals as opposed to long goals. Absolutely. And having Great a plan. communication with your coach along the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well yeah, that's another good one too. Um, I, I do, I do have to give you a shout out for, um, you do really care about your clients. Like even the other day I told you that I was in a little bit of a dump and you sent me a message a couple of days later just to check up. And I really appreciate that. So I, I, I try to be the same with my clients, just letting them know that we do care about them and that we do support them. And as we're not just there to give them prescriptions for training and nutrition, we're there to we're, we're support them in every care. aspect. Absolutely. I love that so much. Thank yeah. you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your conversations and just giving, giving me this opportunity. I don't do IG lives very often. So whenever I have the opportunity to discuss and like unpack your thoughts, I, I just appreciate it so much. So thank you. No, thank you. I would love to do another okay. one. Okay. Um, too, if you're up have there. a great day because your day is just beginning and my day is almost done. <laughs> thank you. We'll talk yeah, later. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us as well. Bye. Bye, guys. Yes, thank you. Bye. Bye.